My name is Nikki Drage. I am a One Mind Dogs coach from Australia. I've been competing in agility for just over 20 years now. Wow, that makes me sound old. <laughs> um, and I have been teaching for about 10 of those years. So during that time, I have helped lots of different dog and handler teams to start their agility competition career. And I've learned a lot of things along the way. And I wanted to share some of those tips with you guys now as well to help you when you're starting with your dog. So before we jump in, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the One Mind Dogs method, just so you know um, where all my tips are sort of coming from. So the One Mind Dogs method started when Janita Lennonen from Finland was competing in agility with her Border Collie Tekla, and she was competing at quite a high level. And then her dog Tekla um, suddenly went deaf. She suffered from sudden onset deafness. And she had to completely change how she handled her because before she was using quite a lot of verbal cues and she had to change to using body language so that the dog could actually see what she was doing. And that involved a lot of experimenting with her dogs and her students' dogs to see how they would react to different kinds of handling. And off that, the method was built. And I've got a quick little video to show you to give you a bit of an idea um, of how it went. It began when Yanita's border collie, Tekla, lost her hearing in 2003. There was only one option left, to handle her dog without any verbal commands. And so began a journey of discovery. Learning from mistakes and trying different approaches. What happens if my chest is pointing to this direction? How important is the angle of my feet? What does the position of my hands say? Gradually, Yanita, with Tekla's help, learned to understand agility from the dog's perspective. What kinds of signals a dog reacts to on the course? One Mind Dogs is based on dog's natural behavior. Any dog, from anywhere in the world, will instantly understand us. We achieve good results without a lot of repetition, because for dogs, it simply makes sense. So, that gives you a little bit Oh, sorry, that gives you a little bit of an idea of where One Mind Dogs came from. Uh, and I will include some more information as well in the emails in case you're interested in the method. Now, these are the points we're going to cover today. So um, we're going to start with talking about training in a competition style and about the competition environment, understanding the rules and routines of competitions, mental preparation for you, taking care of your dog's body and mind, and what to do if things go wrong. So starting with competition style training, and this has to be the one thing that I see students not preparing for. Um, and it's the biggest challenge that people usually face when they start competing and they have issues like their dogs getting distracted or running away or um, being stressed. And a lot of it comes from just not preparing the dog for what they will see in a competition. So dogs really thrive off routine and knowing what to expect. So the first thing and the one that's um, probably least done is that in training, you need to be running sequences with the same number of obstacles that you will see in the competition ring in a row, only rewarding at the end. So obviously, depending on what code of agility you compete and in your country, it might be a little bit different as well. But think about how many obstacles you will see on the course. For us, it's around 14 to 16 at novice level. And you need to be training that many obstacles in a row um, and only rewarding the dog at the end. Obviously, not in every session because your dog is still new and young if you're about to start competing and you want to keep things fun and motivating. But then, for example, once a week or once a fortnight, you might have a full sequence training session with that number of obstacles and only rewarding the dog at the end. And then another time during the week or a different week, you might train on a skill where you're rewarding every second obstacle or you're rewarding a specific skill, for example, or contacts or weaves so that it's broken down. And sometimes your dog is being rewarded regularly, but other times they will see the same exact thing that they will see at a competition where they're expected to mentally focus for an entire course before they get rewarded. And that's something that I would do with my dog at least 15 to 20 times in, in training sessions before I bring them into a ring where I expect them to do that in a whole different environment. Um, if you only have access to say three or four jumps at home, you can number them that many times um, and just make a course out of it. Just, uh, I would recommend not doing that in a small space too often in a row because it can be demotivating for some dogs. So in that case, ideally, you'd want to take your obstacles to a local oval or park where you can um, set it up in a bigger open area or to be able to rent um, a training area if possible in your area as well would be really helpful. 
Another thing is having a judge and ring workers on the course. So you could ask a friend or a friend's husband or parents to just stand in the middle of the course and move around the course while you're running. So the dog gets used to that and make sure that you expose them to all the sorts of things judges do. So for example, I've had students who've mentioned that their dogs got scared of a judge with a hat or a judge with a big yellow raincoat on, um, or there was a judge who was moving towards the dog as it was doing the weaves because they had to cut behind the dog to get to the next part of the course. So all those sorts of things are things that will distract your dog and could cause some stress. So they're things you really want to prepare for as much as possible. And same with ring workers. Different countries have uh, different kinds of ring workers. But for example, in Finland and a lot of areas in the US, it's common to have ring workers sitting on a chair near the course um, so they can stand up and fix dropped bars. So in that case, you need to have somebody bring out a chair and sit next to your training area to get the dog used to those sorts of things. They're all things that you can help the dog um, see before a competition so it's not a new thing the first time they compete. Uh, running with no reward on you seems obvious, but the amount of people that I've had that only ever train with a treat pouch on, and then when they get to a competition, the dog doesn't see the treat pouch and they lose their motivation straight away. So if you currently re re reward with treats or a toy in your hand, I recommend that the next step is that you put that reward in your pocket out of sight so that you still have it, but the dog doesn't necessarily know that you have it and you will surprise reward them randomly. And that then the next step after that is to move it off you and towards the finish line of the course and then rewarding the dog only after you've completed your run. With that in mind, also practicing your end of run reward routine. So at least in our country, the dogs need to be put on a lead before they're allowed out of the ring. Um, otherwise you get disqualified. And that means that we need to teach the dogs that first they need to come to us after the end of the run, have their lead put on, and then they can go get their reward. So doing this also in training will help your dog really be prepared for that routine. So basically, I teach my dogs that after you finish the last obstacle, you look for your lead. Once your lead is on, then we'll run to the reward together. And we won't get distracted on the way. We won't talk to anybody else. It's all about your dog and that reward and having that moment together where you tell them how amazing they are. So the more you practice that routine also in training, which yes, means also bringing your dog to the ring on lead and putting your lead at the end of the course, the same way that you will um, at a competition. Um, and like us uh, here, we have lead stewards as well in Australia who will take your lead off you and walk it to the last obstacle and place it there. Some countries you throw it behind you and the lead steward will approach you from behind and grab it and move it. These are, again, all sorts of things that can distract some dogs and need some um, training before the competition day. So that's something else you want to train. Um, and also letting the dog see where the lead will be by the end of the run. Um, so they get used to the fact that their lead will move and then they can look for it at the end and then you can place it on them before you reward them. Uh, another biggie is training with another dog running nearby as well. So most competitions have two rings running side by side at least. Um, so, or at least one ring running and one ring where people are allowed to warm up, for example. So exposing your dog to that situation is also super important if you can. Um, even if you have a friend with a dog that doesn't do agility, just have them trot around on a lead nearby while you're training. So your dog gets used to ignoring those sorts of distractions. And then lastly, walking the course and running it through fully in one go the first time. So not breaking it down, not training bits on the way. Um, just exposing your dog to the fact that you will run it through in one go. If there's a mistake, you'll keep going and you can fix it um, another day, but just so they get used to running in that style as well, like they will in a competition. Speaking of the competition environment, competitions are a big environment for dogs, especially if they're not used to it. So make sure your dog is okay with noises, any noises that you will see at a competition, such as other dogs barking, the teeter banging, uh, a whistle from the judge, perhaps a announcement. PA system, depends on where you're competing, but there could be many different kinds of noises. Um, ideally, you want to bring your dog to a competition venue before you actually compete. So just bring them along to watch if that's allowed where you are, uh, reward them on the sidelines, have them chilling out with you watching, and just commonly rewarding for focusing on you. Then uh, the other thing they need to get used to is lining up and waiting for their turn with other dogs. So if you're allowed to do that in your venue, that's another thing you could do uh, in preparation. So just go and line up near some other dogs and reward your dog for focus on you. I really like to teach middle for this. So teaching my dog to lie down between my legs and I will just randomly drop rewards every now and then. And that way they feel safe. They won't get approached by other dogs um, from behind or in front because they're right between my legs and I know where they are and I can focus on uh, the course and memorizing what I'm doing. 
Um, again, focusing on you with other dogs running the course, sometimes especially motion sensitive aroused dogs like Border Collies, for example, can get really over aroused mentally by watching the dog before them run. So that's something that they need to get used to. So then you teaching your dog to look at you with a cue such as focus and rewarding them for looking at you when there's other dogs running. And if your dog can't cope with that, then do it from 20 or 30 meters away first. So get all the way to the other side of the field until your dog will look at you and then reward that and then slowly move back in until your dog can cope with watching other dogs running without getting overexcited. Um, another thing they have to get used to in that environment is being crated away from you. So uh, wherever you will keep your dog, in the car, in the gazebo, um, you need to get them used to being crated and that you won't always be around because you might be walking courses or chatting to people or something like that. So if that's not something they're used to, then that's something you need to start training right now. And having people move around or standing near the ring. So I had this once where there was a little kid eating a hot dog while hanging over the ring right next to the course. So be prepared. These kinds of things can happen. Luckily, my dog was fine with it, but there were dogs that weren't. Um, also, we've had a barbecue being cooked right next to the course, those sorts of things. So expose your dog to as many different things as you can so that they get used to uh, ignoring the distractions. Now, uh, it's really good to go into a competition and feel mentally prepared yourself because it will help you relax. So one way to do that is to uh, learn and understand the rules and routines of your specific competition venue first. So um, when you arrive, where will you park? What time are you allowed to arrive? What time can you set up your crates and gazebos and things and chairs? Uh, where can you toilet your dog? Uh, how far away is it from the ring? So that you can make sure that you have ample time to arrive, set up, toilet your dog and warm up before you even have to think about going in the ring. Knowing that and preparing for that alone will help your brain um, be able to focus much more on the course and on your dog on the day. Um, also, when do you need to get into the ring? Is it as the dog is, previous dog is still running? Is it as the previous dog is on lead or as they leave the ring? This is different everywhere. So make sure you ask around and find out what it is for your venue. Um, and if it is while the previous dog is running, then that's another thing you need to train your dog for. So entering a ring while another dog is still competing and also having your dog run a course while somebody else is entering the ring. Those are two things to definitely prepare for as well. Uh, does your dog need to be checked by a vet or do you need to register or check in before the competition? We only have that for major competitions, but it's, again, it's different everywhere. So if your dog does need to go through a vet check first, then make sure that they are used to being touched by a stranger and felt over and checked so that that doesn't add a level of stress for them on competition day. Uh, are you allowed to touch the dog during the run? That's something we're not allowed to do. Here in Australia, you get disqualified if you touch the dog during a run. Um, and also another thing is acknowledging the judge. So before we start the run, we have to acknowledge that um, the judge is ready. Uh, in some other countries, that's not a thing. They blow a whistle and you know they're ready, but you need to find out for you and your um, competition venue what those rules are so that you don't have to worry about them on the day. Uh, in the same regard, what you're allowed to say and do in the ring. So for example, here, we're not allowed to correct our dogs in the ring. We can't say at ah or no. Um, that gives you a disqualification. So again, find out from other competitors what the rules are there so that you uh, are aware of exactly what's happening and also what you're allowed to do in terms of, of touching the dog or repeating something. Um, those are the sort of rules you need to know before you get into the ring. And then lastly, your rules around rewards, leads and collars. Are they allowed to wear a collar while they run? Um, here you can't have any tags on your collar, but you can have a flat collar on. Other codes, you're not allowed any collar at all. You can only allow certain kinds of leads or toys. Is the lead allowed to look like a tug toy or not? Um, those are the sorts of rules you also need to uh, discover from other competitors before you start. Now, mental preparation, it can really help if you yourself are mentally prepared for the day. So that means you need to have plans in place for what you are going to do if the dog makes a mistake. So for example, uh, breaks their start line or misses a contact. Uh, if you make a mistake, so you get lost on the course or you handle something incorrectly, uh, what if you get lost on course? Will you um, stop? Will you repeat that section? Will you run home? Uh, what if you miss your course walk and you have to run the course without actually having walked it? And as a hint, that is something that you should train before the day because it does happen, especially if you have multiple runs or you're uh, watching somebody else. Um, or what if your dog gets distracted, starts sniffing, runs up to the judge? Have plans in place for what you will do with each of those things. Discuss this with your coach. If you don't have a coach, then ask us uh, on the chat bubble at app.onemindogs.com. You can um, ask for help there. 
Uh, but you really want to have all these plans in place so if it happens on the day you don't get distracted and stressed out. Uh, get your own nerves in check if the idea of competing makes you nervous. Please take a mental training course and learn how to think through it. This is something that was a huge game changer for me. There is a lot of mental training content on the One Mind Dogs uh, Agility Premium subscription. And I also took a separate mental training course with Yanita that we sometimes offer. And that's made a huge difference for me in terms of my confidence, in terms of not getting distracted by other people and what they think. Um, and in terms of memorizing courses, because once I stopped being nervous about it, I um, memorized it much more easily because there was more capacity in my brain to focus on the actual course. So really do some work uh, for your own mental training to make sure that you're able to focus. Practice course memorization. So basically look at some course maps, uh, think about what how you'd run it in your brain and then see if you can remember the course after a few runs through it in your mind. This is something you can also do at training. So uh, walking a full course and then memorizing it in, by visualizing. So turn your back on the course, see if you can run the whole course in your mind. If there is a bit where you get stuck, go back and walk it again until you have a routine for how you will memorize the course. And as a hint, that means don't look at numbers. You don't have time to read numbers while you run the course. So you should think of a course as a sequence of handling that you will do. So you will lead out, you will release the dog, uh, go straight on this line, then do a front cross, then turn here and do a blind. That's the easiest way to remember um, what you're going to do on the course. And if you memorize it that way with that visualization, when you get out there and run the course, you'll feel like you've actually run it before and you're just running it again. So um, it feels a lot more comfortable. So that is a strategy to really focus on. Uh, have realistic expectations and be fair to your dog. So if uh, your dog gets a little bit stressed or let's say you haven't got a super solid start line stay, don't expect your dog to perform at their absolute top um, of their training on the day. So uh, only lead out maybe one jump or you could do a running start, for example, the first few times or only hold your dog on their contact for a second. So don't push your dog uh, to the very top ends of their training skills at your first competition um, because there will already be distractions and stress and things like that. So be fair uh, and be realistic in what you expect. And make sure you get enough sleep. <laughs> this is hugely important and uh, often underestimated. When you get uh, enough sleep, your brain is much more able to think and to not stress so easily and it does make a big difference in your attitude on the day. So even if it means traveling up the night before, it may be worth it uh, if it means that you can focus on the day. And also talking about taking care of your dog's body and mind, make sure you rest them between runs. So that means putting them in a crate that you cover up or put away from other dogs so that they can mentally come back down after their run. Don't have them out walking with you on lead through the entire competition because it will just keep them stressed and aroused and looking around and getting overwhelmed. And then by the time you get in the ring, they will have a lot of trouble being able to focus. So give them somewhere safe to rest in between com uh, competition runs, whether that's your car, a crate, anything like that. Um, just a good, safe, covered space where they can uh, relax and get their brain back down. In that regard, travel important if traveling stresses your dog out. Um, if it's a long drive, for example, make sure that you give your dog ample time to come back down. So ideally travel the day before or at least a lot of hours before. And then when you have arrived at the venue, take time to um, give your dog a good walk and um, give them a bit of time to sniff and bring their, um, their brain back down as well. Make sure that you warm up and cool down before your runs. So this is important for the dog's mental state, but also obviously their body um, to make sure that they are ready to run and that their muscles are supple and warm. Um, we will send you a good warm up and cool down guide in the emails so that you have an idea of what sort of exercises you could do to help you and your dog uh, to help your dog feel ready to run. Uh, watch for and respect your dog's stress signals. So if your dog starts sniffing or runs off to the judge, for example, or is trying to get out of the ring, um, these are all very common stress signals. Another thing could be that your dog's getting over aroused, starts spinning, barking, running at you, can't weave, can't do contacts. These are common signs that their brain is overwhelmed. So watch for those and respect them. Your dog is not comfortable. They're not ready for this. You can, uh, I would then leave the ring and um, put your dog away and then work on on those uh, mental state things before you come back and on that same regard don't do too many runs so each run your dog will get a little bit more over aroused or a little bit more stressed if they have those issues so look at your dog's uh, reactions in the ring are they still able to weave can they hold their start line can they hold their contacts 
um, and see how they're coping. The first competition, I would do one, maybe two runs um, and really watch your dog and take note of how they're coping. And then as you start to enter more competitions, you may be able to start increasing how many bit runs they do on the day if your dog is mentally and physically fit enough to cope. Uh, you also want to make sure you're prepared for what to do if things go wrong. So have a clear and consistent plan in regards to what if my dog runs past an obstacle? What if they break a contact? What if they break their start line? Dogs very easily become ring wise because handlers are so excited to try to get a clear round that the dog might break a start in competition and you run anyway, just in case you could still get a clear round. Whereas at training, you would never do that. And then your dog learns, OK, in competition, I can do whatever I want. Uh, in training, I will do it right. And that becomes a very hard dog to train because obviously you only see that situation in a competition. So um, that makes things very difficult for you. So make sure you have clear and consistent consequences to when your dog does something and follow through with them. Uh, if your consequence normally for coming off the start line would be to reset the dog and start again, make sure you first check with the judge if that's allowed. In some codes that will be allowed, but in others it won't. So um, if it's a competition area where you're not allowed to do that, you could, for example, just leave the ring uh, and then in your next competition, see if you're allowed to do not for competition runs. We have those here where you could say to the judge, I'm doing not for comp and you bring a toy in the ring and you can reward the issue that you're having. Um, if that's not allowed in your area, then I would make a very clear note in a notebook and say, okay, we need to work on this situation um, and then not ask your dog for that same skill in the next run if you know that they're um, not able to do it at this point and then it's something that you need to work on at home. So if that issue was a start line, then in your next run, you might have a running start so that you don't even ask the dog for a start line and then you will work on running starts at home. I mean, sorry, then you will work on start line stays at home. Um, so training in the ring, same thing, make sure you're allowed to train in the ring. And um, for some dogs, it's really not a good idea. For example, if they miss a jump, if you bring them back to try and repeat that sequence, it can really shut them down. So if your dog is already a little bit stressed or a little bit low drive, that's something I definitely wouldn't do. And just take the easiest run home if something goes wrong and then focus on training that skill at home. Um, if your dog is very excited and having a great time and they're just um, like going crazy and taking obstacles, that's the kind of dog you probably could train in the ring and um, repeat something or make them stop and hold something if that's allowed by the judge. So again, that's something to confirm with the judge during the briefing um, before your actual run. Make sure you focus on your own team. So if something goes wrong, don't worry about what other people think. The biggest thing is that you're there for you and your dog and it only matters what's happening with the two of you. So focus on what your dog needs um, and make sure you do that. Don't let other people's judgments put you um, down or change how you would advocate for your dog. Um, competing is all about you and your dog and having fun together. So that's the other main thing. Make sure you are having fun. If it's not fun for you, it's probably not fun for your dog either. So in that case, I would take a step back and see what's going on and regroup um, and make sure that every competition is about you and your dog having fun together and testing those skills you've been working on. So that's uh, the end of the presentation, but we are always here um, online at our Agility Premium um, subscription service. So if you haven't been to the website, go and have a look, app.onemindogs.com. Um, even if you're not a premium member, you're able to have a look around as a free user and see what's there. There's a lot of uh, demonstration lessons, so you can get an idea of what sort of lessons there are. Uh, we have hundreds of lessons on everything agility, obstacle training, uh, mental training, handling techniques, sequencing, uh, the list goes on. <laughs> there is so much there for you to learn. Um, and you will get a deeper understanding of uh, what One Mind Dogs is actually all about. You also get personal coach support from me and Lynn and a few of the other girls who are there behind the chat bubble. You can send us videos of your training. You can send us questions, competition videos, uh, and we will get back to you with feedback on your videos and ideas for homework and what to train next. That's all part of the Agility Premium subscription. You also get uh, access to guided courses, which are basically um, online courses with set homework and a coach, and you go along with other students and learn together to keep you motivated. Uh, and you get access to our VIP group where we share mental training lectures and uh, Facebook lives with our coaches and things like that. So these are all things that you will get with Agility Premium. I will send you some more information about that also um, in the follow-up emails as well. All right, thank you, everybody. I'm going to close this now. But again, uh, don't forget, you can contact us anytime on the website or by replying to our emails.